Welcome to the Developer Tribe, where we delve into the process and practice of coaches, educators, and beyond. Today is episode five of season three, and today we're talking about immersive research in an academic and practical setting. And FYI, that there is occasional explicit language in this one. Thanks for being here, however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. My guest today is a social scientist currently at Nottingham Trent University specializing in immersive research to understand people and society. Recent case studies include working with the NHS, Notts County Football Club and England Boxing. His website, Immersive Research, offers a wealth of information and videos relating to research and academic writing. His recent book, Immersive Research, Using Social Science to Understand the Human World, is a tour de force that I'm still wrestling with. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Christopher Matthews to the pod. Thank you. That's the best intro I've ever had in my life. Oh, well, very, I'm very pleased to hear that. What's going on for you? Uh, well, I also, while you were typing it, I was like, well, I better just check what the website name is because I never remember what the website name is. <laughs> so you've done that for me as well, straight away. Um, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, just um, in the middle of kind of getting set up for some summer reading and writing. Everything's finished at university. So um, I've been kind of deep in the books for the last month or so and trying to get a little bit of writing done I've had some moments where I've been like I had to stop and do a bit more reading so so yeah I'm 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 doing the proper classic academic bit at the moment right head right in the books which is great. No superb and I know that you're already working on volume two but uh, Mm. obviously we'll want to speak about volume one today and uh, I want to find out a little bit more about just how you've got to to where you are so so tell us about that. Yeah okay so um where I'm now, I'm 40. I went back into academia. I'll, I'll do a slightly curtailed version of it, but went back into academia in my mid 20s after having a career as a uh, sports coach, uh, squash specifically in personal training. So that was actually my my thing that I did. Uh, I wasn't very academic at school, not the best reader or writer, um, but I always enjoyed sport and I can communicate and I can kind of manage a bunch of kids, which I think is one of the main things, right? For, for for, for, for teaching, um, to working in sport. One of the things that I speak to a lot about my students, a lot of my students are sports coaches doing sports science degrees, is just be prepared that we don't teach them how to manage a group of kids, because that's actually the main thing that most people do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not daft. So what I found was that I was kind of at my wits end with sport after a little while. Um, and I ended up going back into to academia uh, to do sports science. Ended up, don't know how it happened, but I got into Loughborough um, what I do know it was a, I did a HND, um, which didn't doesn't really set people up that well for degrees, but you can still get into high universities with them. Went in on the second year, um, way over my head, but pulled it around and managed to get a two one, which got me onto a master's, which got me onto a PhD. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and that's where I kind of along that journey discovered my love of social sciences, um, specifically sociology. I don't really call myself a sociologist anymore, but that's where I am really. Um, and I've been doing that for a decade or so, um, teaching, supervising PhD projects, conducting my own research, which I do less of at the moment because of supervising more and more. And then more recently, just kind of shifting a little bit into writing books. Um, this is my first sole authored book. I've edited two books with colleagues um, and that we're going to talk about today and I'm writing the second one at the minute. And it's it's just been great. It's just been a really nice shift, a good time in my career to kind of go, right, what am I doing here? What's what's the point in all this stuff? And it, it seems to me, the point for me is to do something a bit bigger than just writing academic papers. I, I found I was getting a little bit stuck with academic papers and a little bit they're not creative enough and it wasn't really doing what I wanted to do. Um, and all this kind of focusing on the stuff that I find really interesting and research methods starting the website which you've mentioned there's loads of stuff there it's a nice way for to me to kind of express ideas and speak to people like yourself on there as well there's a lot of sections on there with stuff not dissimilar to what we'll talk about today and this will probably go up there at some point but also sit and write in books has, has just been far more creative so i find a nice little place for myself at the moment in academia and as we've talked in the past i don't really fit the mold of an of a standard academic so it's always been it's, it's, it's there's a tension in my my life a lot of the time and especially at work. Um, So I found finally at 40 some sort of resolution to that tension um, in terms of carving my own path, really. That's the way that I've kind of done it. So yeah, that's a bit of of kind of background, if that helps. 
Yeah, it's a brilliant explanation. And I think you can tell, certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm about halfway through at the moment uh, for, for two reasons. One, I don't like to know exactly about everything that I'm talking to people about because I ask rubbish questions then. Uh, but the second being that it's going to be so, so useful for, I'm going into my second year of my PhD shortly. And I just found that, yeah, it's going to be superb for that. Um, the, the half that I have read, I've made copious notes. It's dog-eared. It's, you know, there's notes all over the place, which I know you like seeing. I, I saw a picture of, I think someone had uh, bought the book and there was blood on it from, from them yeah. having been in immersive research. Yeah. It's actually from a PhD student, so she didn't buy it. it? Um, and, and she's also um, the person who I've written the book almost about and with at times, the process of supervision. The book is, it's, it's very biographical, as you can tell. I talk about mistakes, and a lot of those mistakes are my mistakes in research. I'm very, very matter of fact about the stuff that I do wrong, and I think that everyone else does wrong. Which I think is something that's often missing in academia, that academics have an air of perfection to them. And let me tell you, none of them are perfect. They're all just as bad as the rest of us, if not worse. So I try and let that come across, to be honest. I'm a bit of an open book when it comes to stuff like that. So I've written that book during some, so the, the process of my development, but also how I then had to articulate that to her. And a lot of the stuff is, it's, it's literally, and she'll, she'll tell you this if you ever speak to her about it, it, it's literally conversations we've had, paraphrased and written slightly with le- slightly less swearing, and then, <laughs> and then put into a book format for other people to understand. And she's in combat sport as, as well as I was when I was doing my research and yeah, there's blood all over the book, which is good, as well as notes. So it's it's like a, it's a, it's a, the perfect use of the book. And I, as you kind of hinted as well, I say in the book about writing on the book and I, the way that the book's been produced and edited allows space for writing on it because it is a it's a it's a tool. It's not a it's not a kind of bland book that you're supposed to read and just digest. You're supposed to think with it, return to it make make jokes on on the page about how you don't understand something at this point and come back to it later day and scribble on it and all the rest of it so i'm glad that you found that and she certainly has found that as well to be useful yeah i I would describe it as a tool i i think that's a really really good description of it the way that you've put it together allows for it to become this um this partner in your research yeah. and in what you're doing, which, which uh, because of the way that you've written it in a conversational tone as well, there's, there's elements of it that have, I've found myself, it's been much easier to take on the information and the concepts because of that, um, rather than uh, having to delve into, you know, the really hard language and, and barriers that that can cause. Yeah. Um, but you, you mentioned combat sport, you know, your, your research has obviously taken place in many different worlds, but boxing seemed to be a bit of a constant for you. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the, the thing that I found the most enjoyable. Um, and you mentioned a couple of the projects that I did, um, the NHS one, the Notts County one, they were actually quite early on in my career. Um, the kind of consistency has been within boxing. Um, did it for my PhD research, went off and did other other postdoc research and then came back to boxing. I actually came back to it when I was at Brighton um, <clears throat> in my first full-time academic position, away from home, away from my partner, away from my dog. I actually know the dog came with me. So she kept me out of trouble a little bit, but basically I was spending too much time in pubs. That was what was happening. And I'd, I'd, I've always been quite good at working in pubs. So I'm, I'm still getting a lot of work done. I'm, I'm functioning quite highly, but I'm still spending too much time in, in, in pubs. So what are you going to do? So in, in the end, I started boxing again, just to, I had to drop at least 15 kilos. I was, I was, I was, I was I'm, 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 I'm not small anyway, but I, and I was getting fat at the same time. So I, I, I went back into the gym with the idea of just getting into shape. Um, and then I realized I could get into shape to have a fight. I thought, right, I'll get down to middleweight. And then when I got down to middleweight, I started to think about having a fight. And this is in my late thirties um, that I was having my first competitive fight, even though I'd boxed for a year, I'd never, never had a fight. Cause you know, I'm in my thirties. Why do I need to box? <laughs> right. um, and I never really, you know, I, I had a half decent career in squash when I was young, but I've never identified as an athlete in any way. I've, I don't put any up kind of um, personality into that. Any of my kind of ideas about myself into that. But I love boxing. It's great. Getting punched in the head and punching people in the head is one of the best things. If it's the best thing I've ever done. I, I miss it to this day. Um, so I just ended up basically spending enough time in a boxing gym that I thought, well, I've just got to have a fight now. And then I ended up having three because I lost my first two. 
and I had to, had to at least win one. Um, and then brain problems, basically. I don't kind of, I don't like to skirt around the edges. It was a like small brain injuries, headaches, not being able to remember words. Um, yeah, struggling to handle academic ideas that I used to throw around with confidence, forgetting forgetting that stuff and. A friend of mine, Alex Channon, who I write with, he he always thinks around. He uses a phrase, um, "thinking around corners," which is obviously impossible. But the, if you're the sharper you are, the more you can kind of get a little bit further around the corner. And I lost that. Um, and obviously, if you're lecturing for a living and trying to research for a living, you need that back. So I had to stop in the end, which is it's still a, it still wounds me to this day that I can't box. I absolutely love it. I, I, if I didn't have to work using my head, I would just carry on boxing. But I need my head, unfortunately. So yeah, that's been my career really, has been kind of largely around boxing. And I'm still threatening to make a comeback. <laughs> one one day, is it maybe yeah. in an over 35s league or something like that? No, you're not allowed to actually, to, to get an amateur license, amateur boxing license in the UK. I'm too old now. But believe it or not, I can still do non-licensed boxing and I can do bare knuckle boxing, which I, that, that's the thing that gets me now is bare knuckle boxing would be hilarious because it's so quick right there's no <laughs> there's that, that that's over in a in a flash yeah. I to, <laughs> right all I have to get in shape is my point i could just go and do it but i'd have to fight at heavyweight now so I'd, I'd have to lose a little bit of weight yeah there might be some complications there <laughs> as, yeah, as you say yeah, I'd rather, well one, one of the things i'd rather get knocked out once than what i was doing before which was hours and hours of sparring and training and basically taking loads and loads of blows to the head like getting knocked out sounds brutal and I shouldn't make light of it, but I'd rather get knocked out once than repeat a blow to the head. Simple as that. Anyway, move well, on. Fair, I'll get, I'll get told off. If, if any of my, my, if my partner or PhD students hear this, they're going to kill me for saying that I'm going to fight again. <laughs> so maybe try and try and keep you away from it. But yeah, I mean, yeah. look, you mentioned it in the book and there's a moment where you're, there's a reflection, a personal reflection where, you know, you've been hit in the head and you, you make that comment of, well, oh, that's, that's some brain injury, you know, that's some brain damage. And that's yeah. obviously a thought that's running through your head at the time whilst you're trying to box as well. Um, so that kind of started to speak to me about this idea around immersive research that I presume there's sort of an autobiographical version of it. And then there's more of a, uh, an eth ethnographic version of it where you're looking at other people. So, you know, start to tell us about what immersive research means and, you know, how that's worked for you. Okay. So the, the way that, the way that I've come to this in the end is a, is a very simple phrase, intimate familiarity which I use in the book, and it's a, it's, a, it's a term from Herbert Bloomer's work in the 60s. And Bloomer was like an anti-psychologist, basically. <laughs> He'd seen, and, and this is psychology as it once was, uh, which was kind of invested in the hard sciences. You can know people's brains and we can measure them with, with scales, and that's fact. You know, it's kind of somewhat outdated. I say somewhat outdated version of psychology because there's still, still versions of that where that holds true. But Bloomer... Uh, I feel like I have quite a lot in common with him in that he, he, he had a real bee in his bonnet about psychology. And I have a bee in my bonnet about research methods in general, not specifically to psychology, although I do have some issues there as well. So when I read his work, it, it speaks to me far more than some of the more toned down versions that we hear um, today. So Bloomer talks about intimate familiarity. It's such a simple idea intimate a closeness to take the sexual side out of intimate and use the word just as a closeness to someone and then familiarity the, the knowledge that you have of your family so when i kind of throw this at people when they start to ask me kind of questions about this and let's say i've critiqued someone about their methods being too detached um or not close enough to people i say to them who do you know best in the world if i was to give you a test you can have a test on anyone in the world who would it be and it's probably going, if you're young, it's probably going to be your mum and dad or your sisters. And if you're a bit older, like me, it's probably going to be your wife or maybe even your kids. Intimate familiarity, they're the people you know best in the world. So it seems so obvious to me that we should use that sort of method to get to know people. And that we should use that knowing, that knowledge as scientific knowledge. Now, we can't just go and knock about with people and say there's some science because that's too simplistic. So we have to put some sort of system into that play, into that. And we have to put some discipline into it. But as a very basic premise, that's what I try and do. Try and get to be intimately familiar with the people that I'm researching. From that relationship, we can then build really interesting interviews, multiple interviews over time. 
which don't just draw on me asking a question, trying to elicit an answer, but actually are about us producing the conversation together, where it's going to go and, and what that might entail comes very much between the two of us. It's clear it's been between the two of us. And we can also do some checks and balances. So you've just told me that you don't like punching people in the face, but I just saw you earlier in the gym with me, punching me in the face, and you had a smile on your face. So you can have these kind of checks and balances conversations. The one that I always use with my students is, if you ask 10 people if they're racist or not, don't be surprised when they all say, no, they're not racist. But also, do we know they're not racist? No, of course we don't. We know that they know to say they're not racist. How do we find out if they're racist? We follow them and we speak to them and we watch them. And we hang out with them at times and we see, you know, do they, do they say something that's mildly, quote unquote, mildly racist or are they overtly racist in different ways? Now we can say, I saw this person be racist, but when I asked them, they said they weren't racist. That tells us something much more interesting than the question, are you racist? That's about this kind of notion of really getting to know someone. When I say it like that, it seems so obvious to me. It seems so obvious. And I think I say this in the book about just getting to know how someone ticks just seems to be such an obvious research method. But it doesn't sound like science to people. It doesn't sound like we're doing something that's a validated survey and that we can do statistics on. Yeah, you can't. I don't want to. I've got no interest in that sort of stuff because a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in does not, does not work well with numbers, does not work well with validation because it's me asking men about why they enjoy punching each other. Give, you know, give me a score out of 10 about how much you think you're a sadomasochist. It's not really, it doesn't really work, does it? So <laughs> I, I, we, we're kind of getting into worlds which, which really require qualitative methodologies. And then it's trying to really capture the essence of that and the essence of intimate familiarity and essence of being immersed with these people and then build science around it rather than thinking, oh, that's not science. We can, we can just do what we like. It's still science. And I make a claim in the book around the importance of, of this still being social science <clears throat> and not losing that term, holding on to that term and fighting for that term. A lot of people have given up on that term and talk about doing something else. And, and their answers are never good enough for me. I've never had anyone answer that effectively um but say rejecting the, so the science label I, I i i find if you're not doing science that's fine you can do something else but then you, you probably don't want to be at a university doing that you might want to be in a gallery doing art that's that's great that's very legitimate but i think if we're doing science we're doing science so yeah roundabout way of answering the question no no it's great i and i suppose i would i would put it as kind of it's it's a difference between making observations that you might just make in sort of everyday life, depending on what context you're in, to really being critical uh, and critically reflecting on, on those things. Um, yeah. It was interesting that earlier you said, I, I'm, I don't call myself a sociologist. So, so what, what do you call yourself, if anything? <laughs> yeah, so just one more before we get into that, just to pull on your point there, it's the difference between pub talk and academic talk. Which is again, I don't know if you've got that to the back bit in the book yet, but that's a, that's a, a lesson that I think I use quite a lot. Pub talk's great. It's flowing. It's flexible. It's leisurely. Politics one minute, cars the next. Great. You'd learn a lot in pub talk, but it's not science. It's not drawing on pre-existing knowledge. It's not got a structure to it. It's not got formu formu formulaic kind of nature. Um, trying to remember the question no it's gone what was the question again sorry uh, the, the question was you know you said earlier that um you, you don't term yourself a sociologist uh, yeah. and, and, and perhaps there's no there's no real sort of term uh needed here but is is there a a, a role frame a, a role designation that you give yes so one of the things that i will eventually do when the three books are finished is it's it started off as two books now it's three it, and there's actually a, an idea for the fourth but we won't talk about that yet <laughs> is I would have thought in each book, I will refer to myself differently. So I think in this book, I call myself a social science, social scientist and epistemologist. I'm reading a lot of existential phenomenology, Sartre, whatever, it doesn't really matter, the, the big words about understanding experiences is the best way to kind of think about it. So I, I'm, I'm playing with the idea about referring to myself as an, an, an existential social scientist or something like that. And then the final book, it's going to be far more about ontology and epistemology. So I'm going to talk about myself as maybe a research philosopher in that book. 
with a with a point of making a teachable moment at some point about these three different ways in three different books that I've referred to myself and showing the, the ridiculousness of boundaries and the ridiculousness of saying I'm a sociologist. It's, I mean, to, to call myself a sociologist is daft because there's loads of sociology I don't know. And there's loads of other stuff that I want to draw on that's got nothing to do with sociology. So it, it just feels it feels really false in every way. And someone could easily say you're not a sociologist, Chris, because you don't have all these bits of, you know, of, of knowledge. Fair. I, I don't mind that. Um, but at the same time, that's why I kind of draw on uh, social science in this one. I've done something similar with um, rejecting titles at work. Um, and you, you actually use my uh, university affiliation. I, I won't use that anymore for another reason connected to that as well. I, 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 I'm, I'm doing my research and I'm doing stuff that I think is important. Yes, the university paid me and I do a job for the university, but I see myself very much independent from them. I feel, see myself very much independent from the way that they define what my job title is as well. Um, again, largely going back to what I said earlier about having attention with work and attention with, with who I am and what, what I am and how other people think I am. It makes me just kind of reject it all basically. So I don't refer to myself as a senior lecturer anymore. Um, I don't really refer to the institution anymore. And I, I make up the title whenever I feel su suited. I, I, I've started calling myself a, a, a research consultant now as well, just because that's another part of the stuff that I do. So I think it's important to not necessarily get fixated on these things, but to recognise the ridiculousness of all of these sort of titles and that we, 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 we think that they mean something. And then, and then they largely don't, especially once you're established. I get it when you're young. When you're young, oh, I'm at this university and... I know this discipline, fine, I get that. I'm, I'm way past all that sort of shit. So I, I make it up as I go along with how I want to refer to myself that day, to be honest. I'm not going to like start completely flipping my identity. I'm not going to start identifying as a woman and all that kind of stuff that, that a lot of the world is kind of taking the piss out of at the minute. But in terms of work, I will do. And and look, I, I think if I if I was to have guessed uh, some of the answer, I think that's probably what I would have said, having had a conversation with you previously, and then reading parts of the book as well. The the focus really appears to be the the output. What are we getting that's that's valid and that is useful out of the content of the research that I'm doing, and how can I help others achieve that style of research as as well? So, in that interest. You're one of the things that I'm certainly struggling with at the moment, and I'm sure many do, um, both in research and also as coach developers, you know, in a professional capacity working with other coaches, this idea of negotiating your own presence within that context. So distance, you know, how, how, how intimate, how close or how far away from the context are you? Uh, is there an issue potentially of starting to form ideas around surveillance, you know, and, and therefore the people that you're working with or researching are operating in a, in a different way to how they would be otherwise? And I suppose the obvious answer is, well, of course, it's going to change and you can't change that. But presumably from a scientific point of view, there are sort of best practices, should we say. Yeah, so I think the, the, here's where I'm going to kind of go back on one of the things that I said earlier about the scientific point of view, because we just have to, at the same time as me wanting to hold on to the claim scientist, and I'll call myself a social scientist, <clears throat> I also reject it in certain ways, because there's parts of hard sciences, in, in air quotes, that, that people have to understand become a nonsense when we do this sort of research. And especially, depending on your your access and sorry the, the path that you access academia through this is where this can be problematic when i speak to people who have got that sort of hard science background which is what i had um they're very much still wedded to validity reliability in, in a quite a simplistic way which i would argue um doesn't make any sense in in, in the hard sciences anyway but it's more obvious why it doesn't make sense in the in the social sciences so when we're talking about this sort of research and, and, and just you know just for people who don't know any of our work going and staying in a boxing gym for 18 months basically and training full-time um and going from not being able to fight to being all right and, and to be able to hold my own to be able to take punches on the nose no problem and, and uh, the, one of the ones that i talk about in the book is my nose has now lost all feeling so i can whack my nose so it looks quite weird when i do it but i can whip my heart my nose as hard as i can it doesn't hurt 
um, that sort of level of um, being immersed in the sport, of ingraining your body in that world, that gives us something and that gives us access to stuff that other people don't have. Now, that access isn't perfect. That access is problematic. All access has strengths and weaknesses. Every method is fundamentally flawed as well as having strengths. But once we start to kind of move past this, like we've got to make our research valid and not biased, and we go, right, research is biased. Research has issues. Um, all research comes from the production of knowledge between me and the people I speak to. You know, even just if I, if you ask the same questions as me, the fact that I go in and I've got tattoos all over the place and I'm, I'm 100, 105 kilos will put some, and a beard, a bigger beard than yours, will we'll put some people off. And some people might look at you and say, oh, I don't like glasses, get away from me. So instantly, just on the representations of how we're being with these people that we're interviewing, it's going to change things. So even there, now we start to think about what's my background in knowledge. Well, my background in knowledge is now I know loads and loads about sport and I know loads about boxing. So people can speak to me in a very different way as they'll speak to you about boxing. So you might ask a question, exactly the same question as me, and you don't pick up on the answer in the same way as I do. For right or wrong, for good or bad, you might take a completely different tack, which is really, really useful, but you probably won't be one about, you know, what it, what's it like to get whacked on the nose and cry the first time. You might not ask that question because you might not know to ask it. Um, or the opposite, what's it like to whack someone on the nose and see them wilt and fall in front of you? What's that feel like? So these sort of kind of ways of understanding things, intimate familiarity, you wouldn't expect someone, your next door neighbor to know your family like you do, but you would know that they could get to know them and they could ask different questions and the knowledge could be valid in certain ways, but different ways. It breaks down those kind of, those worries that people have around this closeness is problematic because we know it's problematic. So it, it's not a problem it being problematic. It's not an issue, it's problematic. Then you say, well, okay, that doesn't sound very scientific. And at that point, that's where we have to do our work. That's where we have to do something about it. We have to manage and mitigate those issues. So if I have got a really, really close relationship I have to, with someone I'm interviewing, I have to think about what that means. You know, there's certain things they won't say to me because I might know some of their friends. There's certain things that I might be able to get from them because I know some of their friends and I have to consider that and I have to look at it. It takes a lot of reflection, reflection. It, it takes a lot of consideration and it takes ways of, of, of trying to get that person to recognise that this is now something different. Yes, we're friends. Yes, we train together. But now I'm going to try and do some science with you and I need you to be as open and honest as possible. Um, and then you'll be able to have a second interview further down the line and check things. And there's lots and lots of ways that you can kind of try and mitigate and manage. The, the, those terms are really useful, though, to mitigate, to stop the problem in some way, but not completely, and to manage to accept those problems and try and do something about it. So what I tend to find is everyone knows they've got to be reflexive now. They've got to have reflection and research. Yeah, well done. Good. That's a good start point. But when I review papers and there's people talking about, I've started seeing these reflexive statements. And um, it's like, OK, so you've told me loads and loads of problems with your position in the research. What the fuck did you do about it? Like, what did you, genuinely, what did you do? Because you've just told me all of this stuff that's made your research really good and possibly really problematic. So what? And it needs the so what? And it's always about a horrible phrase, but still one that I think I tend to live my life by. Don't give me problems, give me solutions. So here's the problem. Here's what I did about it. Bye. That's it. It's, it can be broken down as simple as that. I knew all these people because I've trained them for 10 years and I'm now doing research on them. OK, what do you do about it? Well, I did this, this, this and this. I accepted these problems still, but this is why this is still good and legitimate. Someone who's in that example, someone who's researched, known a group for 10 years can give information that I couldn't even consider getting. Nowhere near it. They'd look at me and run a mile. Which this person can be like, I knew you when you were 10. Now you're 20 and you're going to tell me this story. What amazing research that could be. But fundamentally problematic at the same time. Because, the, again, they might not tell them something or they might assume something about them. So manage and mitigating that closeness. But at the same time, acknowledging that the closeness is really, really good and gives you lots and lots of opportunities for telling really interesting stories. Um, and the realities of people's lives coming off the page because you know their lives. It seems so simple. I say this, I do these interviews and I'm like, 
I'm saying something really obvious here. You know someone really well and you tell you tell a story about them. It's like, yeah, that worked, didn't it? Yeah, it's funny that because you knew them well. <laughs> right, but but at the same time, it's it's a huge skill. You know, it's it's um especially if you are, you know, really familiar with them already, as you said, that you, that you've got to be cognizant of their biography, your past with them. Um the context you might be in right then is it is it that you've set up for an interview is it uh, in situ uh, have you just had a fight uh you know the the whole situation and the context that you're operating in has to be taken into account at the same time you're trying to respond reflexively to what's happening in front of you so yeah okay it might be obvious to to make the statements that you have but the skill that goes into it is is huge yeah, there's, a, there's work to do to formalise it, but it's, it's not, as long as you're not a, a complete dweeb, a complete nerd who's never interacted with people socially, right, which obviously academia is full of those people, but most of us aren't. If you're not that person and you can function socially in a social group, well, you've already got most of the skills. Yes, you've got to refine them. Yes, you've got to deliver them in a disciplined way. And there's no assumption just because you can kind of hold a room and have conversations and tell a few jokes to people doesn't mean say you're a good researcher. It might mean that you're an egomaniac and you can't get yourself out of the way of the research. Um, but what you do have to do is be aware that you've got the skills. I say this to the students when I'm talking to them about interviews. It's like, you've got this. Have a chat with your person next to you. Right, you basically done an interview. Now we're going to put some parameters around that and we're going to sort it out. And then you're right. It becomes a skill and it gets refined and it only gets better over time if you keep thinking about it and refining it, it's where it becomes, oh, I can do this now. It, that's where the skill starts to falter. You don't practice it. You don't listen back and think, well, I, I missed that there. Or even worse, and, and, and you'll find as you get to the latter part of the book, I'm very much, I'm adamant that research methods has to be linked into how we use theory and use academic ideas. So you might go, oh, I've got a career now. I don't need to worry about reading extra stuff. And now you're just continually reinterpreting the same different stuff, but through the same lens. And you've stopped learning and you've, you've stopped thinking, you've stopped growing your kind of knowledge base. So because you're so central to the research, you're so central to the interpretation and the story that's being told and the questions that are being asked, you, you have to keep growing as an academic. You have to keep reading. Um, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm always astounded by is people who have a career of, looking at the same topic or using the same academic idea on different topics. I, I, I mean, I get bored of stuff that I, I spoke about last week. So, or I was thinking about last week, I, I'm already kind of onto something new. I mean, that's probably me. Right? I, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm quite quick on stuff. I just want to move on and do the next thing, um, which is problematic in certain ways. Luckily I'm a finisher as well. So I get things done. But the point is if we kind of, it, don't accept that it's a skill we think we can just do it then then it becomes problematic as long as we're kind of aware oh okay hold on i've got to keep refining this skill then then it works um it's good that you've highlighted it as a skill but at the same time it shouldn't be something that someone's intimidated by the conversation with someone the other day who was talking about like how do i get started what do i do and they were looking for the perfect thing that was going to be like their almost their like um here's your ticket to start doing your research it's like no 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 no, no. You, you get in you get your ethics and you get in you get in the gym you get in the church you get in the pub whatever it is you want to do and you get in and then you start looking at how shit you are and you do make yourself better over time you accept that you're not going to be good at interviewing you accept you're going to miss stuff you make all your notes you look back at them you have conversations with your supervisor and you get better that that's the way it works so yes you're right it's a skill yes it's got to get better but at the same time what are you going to do you know it's not practice like it's the same as sport i want to play i want to play football all right let's start kicking a football about then i'm not very good yeah no shit get better keep kicking it right and and this idea of of immersion and i think that's what drew me to your work in the first place i'm sure i came across you on social media i can't exactly remember um remember where but this idea of immersion into the space in which you're looking to research immediately resonated with me that that it it can't be that you go in for a bit and you see them in practice and then you get a total understanding of what holistically is going on yeah um, and again that's another obvious statement 
but it's important to, to to lay it and it's it's made differences or it's made changes to how I'm thinking about where my studies will go with my PhD that initially there were certain people that I wanted to to speak to but then in on reflection I don't have the access or indeed the time and availability to go and speak to those people consistently be in their environment consistently and therefore the knock-on effect to what the the results probably would be and and the validity the 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 contextual nature of them isn't going to be there so that's already made me think about well actually who am I even targeting with this based on what's the quality of the research that I want to get out yeah so there's there's a couple of moving parts in there just let me unpick a couple of bits so first off we can't fetishize any method right now. I will almost always do the sort of stuff that I like to do because I, 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 the way in which I get to want to get to know people, the answers that I'm looking for are usually good in my method, methodology of getting close to people and spending time with them. Plus, as you've read in the book, I don't trust what people say. I don't mean that in a, I'm not a trusting person. I am. But words, words, I think are capricious. They, they're slippery. And I like to have knowledge of what people are doing. Now, that's that's me. But research methodologies can't, this isn't the methodology to use for this study, right? It it, it can't just be as simple as that. It has to emerge. I talk about that in the book. The the study, the knowledge that we've already got, you, the people you're researching, the the gaps that we've got are are what drives the methodology, right? So a, a survey can be perfect. And if you said to me, Chris, I've got this group of people, no one's ever researched them, and they're spread about all over the globe, that's obviously a survey, obviously an online survey, right? No one's ever heard anything about them. And then you go, oh, Chris, there's this group of people. There's loads of work on surveys. But I think knowing some of these people, it doesn't really capture what these people are really like. All right, now you need to go to get to know them. So in, in just back to your example, I would I would look at that. And, you know, I'm only taking a piece of what you've said. So, you know, don't don't take this as gospel. But I'd look at that and I'd say, well, these people that I'm, I'm interested in speaking to, OK, I can speak to them. I just can't get to know them like I can a different part of my sample. And the, the, the methodology emerges over time. Here's this sample that I really got to know. And here's this sample that I didn't get to know so well for a variety of reasons, but I still interviewed them. And the knowledge that we've produced here has got these strengths and weaknesses. And the knowledge produced here has these strengths and weaknesses. So you, you kind of manage it in that way. And then that gives you the ability to kind of compare and contrast if you like I don't like research that does that as a rule because it, it, there's fundamental issues in it but it allows it to be done it allows you to look at oh these people said this but I didn't really know them these people said this but I did know them well what does that mean that might tell us a methodological issue that's quite important and one of the things that I've been working on with a paper with a PhD student at the moment is one of the the, the artifacts of surveying the artifact of the survey, not of the knowledge of the people that, that, that you're interviewing, sorry, that you're surveying, but the, the, the artifact of the survey is that you get simple answers, right? You kind of answer simple questions with simple answers. So when you're asking about concussion, which is an inherently complex topic, which most people, even doctors, don't know about, but this survey, the artifact was it, that a bunch of sports people without good educations apparently knew loads about concussion. But okay, I mean, maybe they do. I don't know what mechanism it means that this subculture of of fighters seems to have expertise in concussion where doctors don't. So maybe let's look at the method slightly and reconsider it. So the the right method for the right for the right questions and all the rest of it. So that's the kind of first thing that I think needs to be unpicked, or a couple of things there that need to be unpicked. And then the second part of it is just to be a bit more honest about one of these things as well. The reason I did. Um, immersive research what what some people call ethnographic research and we can maybe talk about why I, I i choose to reject the term ethnographic if you want but the reason why i did immersive research was because and i kind of hinted at this when i was doing my phd three years three and a half for me i knew that i could spend at least 16 months 18 months in a boxing gym five days a week like i, I was I said, what why wouldn't i do that what i mean what <laughs> What person on this earth who likes sport and is relatively good at sport, who's doing a PhD, wouldn't do that methodology? It's like, it's just so obvious to me. So, but I can't put that in my PhD, can I? I can't write this, oh, I did this project because I wanted to get punched and punch people and piss about swearing and like drinking Lucasade all day and and probably going to the pub after with the lads. I can't put that. 
Right. So the reality is you then have to come up with some academic justification, right? And I can very easily give an academic justica- justification for my work. But at the same time, there's a personal justification. I think we have to own that as well. I won't put it in my projects, but I'll happily talk about it here and I'll put it in my, my, my books. But I won't write it in papers because we hide the truth in papers so to make it more sciencey. So there's that kind of side to it as well. So that gives people the chance to go and hang out with people they want to hang out with and go and do things that they want to go and do. And you know, as much as I, if you want to go and do well in anything, you better enjoy it. Whether it's a PhD project, whether it's reading for an essay, whatever, you better pick an essay that you're going to enjoy. And lo and behold, you do an all right essay because you read loads because you enjoyed it. And you collect loads of data because you enjoy collecting it because you like speaking to people. And this sort of enjoyment that goes into it is part of that personal justification for doing it. I can't imagine anything worse than a PhD student or an undergrad student coming to me and saying, I want to do a project and I'm already bored by the project before I've even started it. Right. And that happens all the time. It needs to be here. Look, I like skateboarding. Can I speak to some skateboarders? Yes, definitely go and do that because we'll find out something interesting based on your access and your work effort, that your, your work ethic that you'll put into it. Then we have to construct and find and legitimize, legitimize the academic justification. And that often pro, that process is often secondary, to be honest, especially in a project like mine where I got to pick it and yours, you've, had to, you've been able to shape yours as well. You know, if you go and do an ESRC funded PhD, you're doing what the ESRC funding is telling you to do. Fine. You know, you're going to be a high flyer anyway because you've gone to a big PhD project. But for most of us, there's a lot more fluidity in what we do. And then we just have to go, right, OK, I, I want to do this. But what, what's the justification? And the justification comes from loads of reading. Once you get the reading done, that's your that's your punishment for doing a project that you like. Is You've got to put the hours in to be able to say, right, what am I even doing here? I like it, but what am I doing? Um, and we mind quite luckily there was a bit there still is a bit of a gap in why people enjoy violence there's still a gap in that area that's why i'm writing the second volume all about that um so yeah and you can see the alignment between the, the person me the personality me and also the academic discipline which people who are listening just trust me to the gap <laughs> i could argue I could, I could frame it but i wanted but it, there's a gap i find that gap sorted right job done let's go and that personal connection with with what you've uh, researched and what you've put together in the book, I, I I can get I get that sense as I'm reading it that there's this real personal connection with why you've put this book together, why you've done the research you have, and I think that's what makes it. Um, it's definitely not an easy read, but it makes it an, an easier read than uh, sort of typical research methods methods books. Um, but we, you started to touch on it. It was really kind of the last last part of this that I wanted to to touch on with you. That you know, a common problem with with coach education uh, and coach education research is that coach learners tend to say that uh, academic publications or academic language, academic theory, uh, doesn't really fit. That the language or the insights aren't quite fit for purpose. They aren't quite contextualized. Do, is is this a way of perhaps starting to address that do we as academics need to address that how's that done yeah well for a former student of mine um tom he works in sports development and he's he said to me i need to get the book into the hands of people doing sports development because their research is usually two two ways it be of it being done you know absolutely terrible methodologies where you basically find get the coach to ask the bright little kid who always likes coming can you tell us how much fun you had and the kid goes yeah it was wicked and they write that down okay wicked well done success how many people did you have 60 cool success whereas they don't tell you that 150 turned up and left the next week because the toilets were blocked or whatever so that's the one version i'm being a bit mean there right but um you know the point the point is relatively valid and then the other one is where you bring academics in outdoor outside academics and a lot of them god bless academics they want the money right i've been involved in a project that was like that it wasn't me leading it thank god but it was it was clearly done for the money and like they've got no investment in it i mean i i know some scholars in sports development and they're they're great and they're so well-meaning it's not sports development I'm having a go at now something separate 
put that like that's to most people the way academia is set up now is money followed by publications notice there's no uh, not not a close connection to the people who you're actually researching you know some people some academics um, are, are excellent at that but there's, there's a fundamental problem there so if you've got no motivation other than i need to get five million pounds in or 50 grand in if you're in my area um that's your motivation well then it should be no surprise then that this kind of disconnect happens so there's there's two issues there then but there is a middle ground and the middle ground is those coaches who are collecting that data that i was kind of mean about a minute ago with a more scientific methodology can turn those can 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 tread the path between these two things can thread the needle between these two things because the coaches are really good at understanding where it's gone right or not now if you tell a coach your funding aka your job is ba based on if you get good feedback or not don't be surprised they get good feedback if you say a coach right you're part of this project to help me as an academic get some really interesting data i'm going to get some you're going to get some the kids are even going to get some the kids are going to take pictures they're going to give them little cameras when you take the, you're going to get the kids to take photos and we're going to combine all of this stuff to tell a proper story about what happened here and yes i as the academic or someone who's a little bit disconnected might be the person looking for the more critical stuff you know yeah these kids all had fun but there was 50 that that, that stayed away we start to tell a story which is far more useful again we're using that word quite a lot aren't we we're going to get something out of it it's going to mean something to me because it's scientific it's going to mean something to the kids because they're telling a story about their time it's going to mean something to the coaches because they're like oh shit, i did really well here but also little jimmy didn't like it ah oh, chris chris had a chat with the kids that went away and found some stuff out so i can be better disconnect it from their funding in some way if we can i don't know how to do that that's not my expertise area but then legitimize the intimate familiarity which is the basis of the project with some science to it with some rigor with some discipline with some structure with some system with the, the stuff that i talk about in the book and just going back to what tom said this this lad who's in sports development he was like if you can get this in people's hands who are doing sports development they can start to pull bits of this together which can take that immersive stuff that they've already got. They're already doing it. <laughs> They're already doing the thing that I pride myself on. They're just not doing it like a scientist would. And then they can start to legitimately say, look, yes, I didn't do a survey because I think surveys don't work for this. And here's why, and here's the data I did get. And it was really useful for these, for these reasons. And I think that's where the book can come in quite useful. Like I say, in, in places, it's not the easiest read, but then at the same time, where it does get dense with some of the old theory it's simplified and reduced at the end so if you get a bit still you come to the end you're like oh that's what you meant and those bits i'm thinking at the end i think it's the chapter three and chapter four where there's these these clear bullet points of this is what you've got to do with this but sorry that's the wrong way of phrasing it because that sounds like a how-to here's the foundational principles about how you do this here's how to think about this those things in the in the hands of people who aren't quote unquote proper researchers can be really useful and can up your game really really high um so i think that there's a there's a market there for the book i don't i mean in like me trying to sell and make loads of millions um but in a in a in a, a market for that type of knowledge as a as a kind of personal development thing for coaches i really think that any anyone in practice teachers as well um it probably needs a bit more than the book it probably needs some sort of workshops and whatnot and, and some sort of guidance when people are delivering their own research but one of the things when i set up the, the website with my research consultancy was to say to people look i get it you know you can't do a re you can't afford a hundred grand project with a university all right so get me in and i'll teach your team how to do half decent research and as long as you're open to finding out that actually there's some bad stuff that goes on and that you can be better you're not just wanting to find answers to prove how good you are then i'll help you find that so i think there's that middle ground um i think you've hit on that a little bit um and i feel like i've been also somewhat mean about academics but whatever they're academics i'm allowed to be mean about them <laughs> i was gonna apologize apologize but sub them no no I, th I think you'll cope i think you'll be all right uh come at me i'm yeah. always up for a source out i always say this i'm always up for a source out start on twitter and then then come around and we'll have a chat <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah, your Twitter feed is entertaining to say the least. Um, I was going to say when you said you couldn't remember where you, where you found me, it would probably have been me saying something problematic or provocative on Twitter to try and get people to try and have a go back at me. That's basically what I try and do. Uh, sometimes these conversations are important and, and it yeah, takes think, yeah. like yourself to, to ruffle the feathers enough that people then start engaging with it. And, and you yeah. know, the, the, the book is one way to, to do that. But I think if you've mentioned you're, you're self-published with this book, um, and I've certainly been singing its praises to, to all kinds of people that I, I speak to, um, but tell us a little bit more about how we could lay our hands on the book uh, if they haven't got it already. Yeah. So it's, um, I need to now look at the website. You remember it, immersiveresearch.co.uk. Um, there's a bunch of stuff on there, but the way, the, the place to go, I guess, for people who are listening to this is probably the thoughts and ideas section where I've got a bunch about academic writing, as you said, and a bunch of interviews with, with academics about different areas that I'm interested in. So there's stuff about drugs in sport, abuse of athletes. So, you know, uh, uh, for people who are listening to this, there's some really interesting stuff for you there. And, and it be, you know, it's delivered in a way which is, easily accessible as well but then the bookshop is on there I'm just looking at it now and um because I've self-published basically I'll just give you a little bit of why I self-published um the first two academic books that I did um, I mean you don't make any books as a normal scholar as a, as a normal academic right you don't make any money from books it's great you've got a book you've got your little you've got your hands on your little book I'm looking at a couple down here but they, they the way that academia academic publishing is set up now is that they they basically hook you in to get your book so you've got your book printers but they make all of the money from digital copies so my last book sold 22 copies right this this book has got three editors and 15 or 16 17 authors 22 copies in the world with a with a world-class academic publisher 22 copies i found out i was like what the what am i doing like, i know i'm not going to make any money anyway i, I I've, I've produced this book which I, which is good but it's not been produced how I wanted it to be produced. You know, my, my partner's a graphic designer, more than that, a, a strategy, strategist now for a, a design company. Um, I've always had somewhat of a keen eye, eye for design and, and a few other bits. Um, so I was like, I don't like the way that they work, academic publishers. I don't like that I get no money for all this work. I'd rather get, I'd rather get no money or it cost me money and it'd be how I want it to be. So that was the kind of baseline. And the second thing is that um, I, I've got somewhat of a profile. I say, I think I say that in the book, somewhat of a profile, right? I'm not, I'm not fresh out of PhD and no one knows me. A few people know me, probably because I say stupid shit on Twitter. And that means that in some respect, I was like, you know what? I can, I can put some money into this. And if I lose it, fair enough. But I think I'm probably going to do okay. And I think I released it at the end of March or something like that. And I've sold half the copies today, actually. Funny enough, I sold this, the 200th copy today, which in effect means I wouldn't say a financial success because success would sound like I'm like rolling in it. I'm not <laughs> rolling in it, but like covering costs is sorted. And this will now in, enable me to start looking at the next one. And the financial part of it is put in for the next one. If I'd not sold any copies, it wasn't an amount of money that I would have, I it would have been a good holiday that I would have missed, let's say that. And I'm full-time employed, my wife's full-time employed, we don't have kids, so financially we're okay, right? We don't have those sort of issues. So given all of that context, self-publishing works really well for me. Um, it also means, as you found out, and why we're having this chat today, that I get to speak to people. I don't want to produce a book and then move on to the next and that's it. I don't, I, don't, I don't care about the academic ideas enough. I care about the academic ideas being used by people and helping people. It's always about this utility of it. And I know that I can explain things well. I've got many problems in my life. I've got many, lots of weaknesses, but I can explain stuff to people. So if I write it out in a way that works and then I can get them to engage with me and have a little tutorial or to ask me questions and, and say, what did you mean by this? I know that I can help them again. So every single person that's bought a book has had an email from me and a handwritten note, a, a front page, you know, saying like, thanks. And it says in the book, get in contact. And I'm, I'm trying to genuinely encourage that um, because I know, I know I can help. I know I can do better than the book's done on its own by speaking to people. So that's another part of it. Um, 
we already talked about the design. There's no way that an academic publisher from my level of academia would, would publish a book that looks like that, that feels like that, that's on that quality of paper, that's got that space for notes. Um, and there's got the, 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 the sections between where there's the black pages and a few other things as well. Um, it just wouldn't happen. It, they, they couldn't do it. They couldn't make it make any sense. Um, plus, like the last book I got, I got, I think I got three copies. I got three copies of this book and that was it. There was no promotion. I, you know, I, I'm a, somewhat aware of being about a bit spammy on Twitter about it because I want people to buy it. But at the same time, I can give away copies of books. I can send them to my, my friends who, you know, they like me, but they probably don't like me enough to buy a book off me because it's more for their students than it's for them. But I can send it to them and they're like, oh, actually, I recommend it to a student. And the student brought in. We're back to a, a way of marketing and delivering stuff which has been lost. Word of mouth, friendships and networks, completely lost in academia. All, all that really happens with academic books, as I see it, is that people tweet about them and then they just move on. And that's it. And ac academic libraries will buy one or two. Your institution that you're at will probably buy a couple. And then it's all downloads. And I, I personally can't stand reading in a digital format. I don't listen to music in a digital format. Um, I'm not a Luddite, right? I, I, I can use a computer, but I want to read a book and I want to write on a book. It's my book, so I can write all over it. If I want to draw pictures of dicks on it, I can. That's up to me. And I want that in my hand and I want to dog ear it and I want to go back to it. I've done this recently. I've just reread a book that I read in a PhD and I saw some notes and they were ridiculous. They were wrong. And I was like, you knobhead, you didn't know what you're on about. And I want that to happen. And I've made that happen. So you can tell when I talk about it that I'm happy with it. Right? I enjoyed it. It's been an amazing process. In the previous two books, it was a proper grind. It was a right pain in the ass. And when we finished, it was like, all right, that's that. And we move on. And this is not that. This is conversations with you, conversations with other people, knowing that I'm going to write the second volume and it's going to send people back to the first volume. And eventually I'm going to rewrite the first volume. I've already started it in certain places because the mistakes I've made in it, there's about four or five spelling mistakes in it. And I said something wrong in it as well. I'm like actually completely wrong about Irving Goffman in it as well. Um, but it is, it is really it's teachable moments. So um, it, it's, it's, it's made something far, which, which should be great and creative. It's made it great and creative when I think most academic publishing is is not that anymore plus it's 30 quid if you're full-time staff and it's 20 quid if you're a student or you know if you can't afford to pay 30 quid for any reason it's 20 quid now some people who are not in academia will be like 20 quid for a book academic books my last time academic book was 105 pounds so yes it's it's not the cheapest thing in the world i get that but at the same time um it's, it's limited in supply. It's got a lot of work gone into it. And, and you know, it's not a money spinning thing. Let's just say that I'm, I'm covering costs plus a little bit. But it means that it's open to anyone who wants their own book. You don't have to borrow it from a library and you can get into it. And you can use it like a tool. And, and, that, and that's what I want. I don't, I don't want a book that sits in a library gathering, gathering dust for the prestige of it being in some shit library. <laughs> I, just, I, I, can't, I, can't, I honestly can't think of anything worse than a library book that just sits there. And most do, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. And I, I think it really speaks to this whole thing being a, a living movement uh, for, for you that, you know, yeah. you, you have the website and the detail and stuff that you, you put up there for free for people to connect with. That I've already done. You've got the, the, the sort of the volumes of the books coming. It's, it's this this living thing uh, that is the embodiment of, of some of the work that you've done and then all of the research that you've done, of course. So I mean, from... one, one, more, one more thing on that as well, just before I finish off my rant, because it's a Please. central bit of the rant that I've not done on academic publishing. It's two things. One is the price, which is touched on. Everyone bangs on about how academic publishing, both journals and books, is too expensive. And then they submit journals to journal, papers to journals, and then they publish books so expensive. The second one is everyone hates Amazon. If you don't hate Amazon, go and read about Amazon, and then you'll hate Amazon. Amazon's horrific. And then people are posting images, uh, links, go buy my book from Amazon. It's like two weeks ago, you were saying how Amazon should pay their workers. And now you fucking, oh man, I get so frustrated with this sort of stuff. This lack of, like the world we live in is so complex that we're always going to have hypocrisy somewhere, right? Of course we are. But when it's that obvious, you complain about academic publishing and you complain about Amazon 
and then your academic book is 105 pounds on Amazon. I just want to, I just want to like tear my teeth out and throw them at people through Twitter. And because it, it doesn't have to be like that. And it's the same with all of academia. Academia is amazing. I absolutely love it. It's the best. I can't believe I get paid to do it. But there's loads and loads of problems in it. And what I tend to see is people moan about the problems and accept the problems. And I can't stand that. It's something that I always struggle with. And as soon as I see these, these lacks of coherence in my own life, I get, I get really pissed off with myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically done with Amazon and I'm done with academic publishing in the previous format. I can't see how I will do a book myself through an academic publisher unless they fundamentally change their system in some way to suit me. I can't see how it would work. Anyway, so that's one more little rant. Just about coherence. It's ethics as well, isn't it? It's, it's an ethics thing. Exactly. And it, it again, speaks to your your overall philosophy, so to speak. Uh, yes. I can't profess to know it, but you know, it's clear that all of those things lead from the same set of values. And and that that's that's really clear with with what I've read, the conversation I had with you previously, and of course today. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in your answer to this question. If you could have an audience with one person and one person only, who would you choose? Um it's a tough one. I'll, I'll give you an answer, but it's between two. It's Terence McKenna or yes. Alan Watt. Um, either. But ter- ter- let's go, let's go Terence McKenna. Oh, well, I, I love both of them, so I'm going to allow okay. it. Right, fine. Well, imagine that in a room. Um, my mind would be blown through doing loads of psychedelics and also listening to them at the same time. I don't know which would blow the most. But yeah, I actually tweeted about this recently. This um, the, the, one, of the, one of the things that academia should be all about is creative thinking and thinking beyond boundaries. One of the things that we know we can do with psychedelic drugs is open up our mind. We can think about things in a deeper way. And also we can choose to read beyond that discipline. And what I tend to find is most academic academics are anti-drugs, full stop, definitely anti-psychedelics and think it's like the worst thing in the world and won't read beyond their discipline. And those two things, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, that's anti-science. Now, obviously I'm a, a minority position here saying that psychedelics are scientific or can bring about psych- uh, scientific thinking. But I'm, I would say I'm proof of that. I read outside of my discipline and I do psychedelics, the history of doing psychedelics and still do psychedelics on a semi-regular basis. So those two things I think are really important and completely missed by academia. I don't know why it kills me. Well, I do, because most academics are nerds. That's why. But anyway, those two are the, those two people are, the kind of the, the, the perfect mixture of that where they're so well read they, the, the philosophical philosophical thinkers rather than scientists as such i think but nevertheless they're so well read they're so intelligent and they you can clearly see that that process of reading thinking and having mind expanding substances just makes them incredible and i wish that that was more normalized i wish that it's one of my things one of the hills that i will die on is that academics should be forced to do psychedelic drugs to a point. <laughs> unless, the, unless they've got lots of issues already. I, I presume you're not getting them all in the same room in order to do that. Oh God, no. They can <laughs> do it on their own. Stay away from me. I'm not doing drugs with not doing psychedelics with people who've never done it before. I'm not into amateurs. They can sort themselves out. There needs to be an admin team for that at the university. They can sort that out. University's psychedelic admin team, that's what we'll start. The as if we need another branch. <laughs> 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 more bureaucracy good Chris thank you so good question. much I, I, good question uh, yeah welcome I, thank you so much for the conversation I've I've really enjoyed that and and thank you for for taking the time to put together you know all of the detail that you have and that you're currently putting together as well um personally and I'm sure for many many other uh academics and burgeoning academics it's going to be a real source of uh inspiration and insight so you know really thank you very much for that and just leaves me to say welcome to the tribe cheers thanks very much and if if people do want to get in touch with my i direct messages on twitter that are open so you can just access them without following me uh without following back and all that um the book's subsidized for for people who can't afford academic books so get involved and grab the book um and if you've got any questions feel free to send them in to you and we can maybe cover them again at a future one or just send them to me and i'll, and I'll have a chat with them i'm more than happy to discuss these ideas and help people think through them. no problem
Yeah, superb. I'll make sure that all the all the links and, and everything is uh, available so that people know how to reach out to you. Okay. Thanks again. That's it for episode five of season three. And our thanks to Chris for giving his time and insight today. Keep an eye on our social media over the next week or so for a further announcement regarding his work. So don't forget to subscribe and follow us on all of our channels. More people are joining us over at the developertribe.mn.co where we were recently discussing leadership and care in coaching. We hope to welcome you into the tribe soon. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next week.